Have you noticed at Christmas time that a lot of people really aren't into Christmas for the right reasons? You notice that in society? And I have to wonder, why are you celebrating Christmas then? You see that with other holidays. Frankly, you see it as well with many things that we do in life. Why do we do what we do? Why do we even come to church? What's the reason for it? Is it just something we do out of habit or because someone bugs us to be here? Or I don't know. You ever think about that? Why am I doing what I am doing? Well, today we're going to talk about that as it pertains to the Lord's Supper. Today is an ordinance service where we'll be having a feet washing demonstration and we'll be receiving the Lord's Supper. And the question becomes, why celebrate the Lord's Supper? Why do we even do this? Do we know why it is so important that we do this from time to time? And that's what we're going to look at today. We will be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. If you have your Bibles with you, we encourage you to turn there. You can also pull it up on your phone or your tablet if you have an electronic gadget with you. Or if you want to use one of our pew Bibles, it can be found on page 1138. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. These were the instructions that the Apostle Paul had for an ancient church that was struggling because... Well, they were struggling with idolatry, but they also wanted to come together under the banner of Jesus Christ and share together even in this Lord's Supper. Hmm. That's an interesting combo, isn't it? What does Paul have to say about that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 14. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And we'll stop there this morning. Well, you can see that Paul makes no bones about it. If you're struggling with idolatry, which many of these dear Christians at yeah. Corinth many years ago were, he says you need to flee from it. What does it mean to flee? It means to run away, get out of there, stay away from it, flee from it. And this was a real problem in that society because many of the people who were becoming Christians had lived an idolatrous lifestyle. And they even sacrificed in some way to these gods, whoever they were. We know who they were if you look in history, but we're not going to go into that today. So we'll assume here we don't know who they were. A sacrifice would be offered, and after the sacrifice was offered, many times you would take the meat from that sacrifice and eat it. Sometimes it was sold in the marketplace. People would buy it and eat it. But this is what was going on. It was an offering made to a false god. And as the Bible said, making an offering, making a sacrifice, worshiping an idol or a false god, even though that false god made out of wood or stone or metal or whatever it was, behind that, ultimately, it was demonic. It was a participation in demonic activity. So what does Paul say? Flee from it. Get away from that. Now, what does this have to do with the Lord's Supper? Well, as we said, many of them were participating in idolatry or struggled with it in the past, and then they were coming together as Christians to receive the Lord's Supper. And so by dabbling in idolatry and also coming to be under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Lord's Supper, they sort of had one foot in each camp. They were two-timing it, if you will. They certainly weren't taking it very seriously to follow Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. So you have to ask, why were they even doing that? What was the point? 
Well, I think there was a misunderstanding. So I would like to come to us today. Why are we here to celebrate the Lord's Supper? It could be that we struggle with something, that we have some other kind of God in our life, not necessarily a statue or a cigar store Indian or some kind of idol that we bow down to. But there could be something that we really wrestle with and it becomes like an idol to us. And then we come together here with God's people and we worship Jesus in many different ways, including through the Lord's Supper. Well, if we're struggling with that, we have to ask ourselves, why are we here? Knowing that we are to be under the banner of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, those other things that are acting like idols, what do we do? Flee from them. And then when we flee from them, what can we do? We can come together and participate in this wonderful supper, this wonderful meal that Paul says is a participation in the body and the blood of Christ. Look at verse 16 again. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The br bread that we break, is it not a participation in the in the body of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, even in Old Testament times, whenever the people would offer sacrifices, legitimate sacrifices to Almighty God, the sacrifice was made and you would eat a part of the sacrifice, a part of the meat uh, that was cooked then, as a way to show that you were in union, that you were, uh, you wanted to be restored in your fellowship to, to God. That's what it meant. And so today, though, when we take the bread and the cup, it's a little different. We're not taking meat that was sacrificed in some way. We are taking symbols that have been ordained by our Lord. Bread and then the cup. And we see that the bread represents his body. The cup represents his blood that was shed. So when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we too are participating somehow in the body and blood of Christ. There's a picture, if you will, of that Old Testament, make the sacrifice, eat the sacrifice, New Testament, there's a symbol here of the sacrifice that was made, we eat it, and it's a participation somehow with Christ. Now many people might say, well, what, how is the participation, what does this mean? How are we participating in his body and in his blood. Uh, what, what does this mean? Well, here's my theory on it. Whenever the Old Testament people, whenever the Jewish people would remember something, remembrance was not simply, oh, I remember what I did last week. Oh, I remember when I was a little kid. It was much more intense. When the ancient people would remember something, it was almost like they went back in their mind and they relived the events my goodness how many times do you read throughout different scriptures in the psalms for example even in the new testament where they recount wonderful things that god did one of the big things is getting god's people out of egypt through the red sea to the promised land over and over again we hear this they remember and relive it remember and relive it so when we come to receive the bread and the cup, we are not only remembering, in my opinion, what Jesus did, but we're kind of reliving it, if you will. We're reliving it. Think of it this way. Have you ever been somewhere, maybe, I don't know, the town that you grew up in and you haven't been there for a while? Or you see people that you knew a long time ago, or even uh, maybe hear a song or read something that takes you back to a former time, and in so doing, you feel, oh my word, I'm reliving that event from many years ago. I, I just feel almost like I'm there. How many of you have had an experience like that? I see some hands up, absolutely. Well, that's kind of what the Lord's Supper does for us. You see, when we come together for the Lord's Supper, what it does, it teaches us in a different way than a message or a lesson does. In a message or a lesson, you hear the story about Jesus, but with the Lord's Supper, with the bread and the cup, 
you learn and I learn in a different way. We see things. We see the bread in the cup. We feel it. We touch it when we take the bread or hold the cup. We even taste. We even smell. It affects the other senses in a way that should cause us to really remember and relive what Jesus did for us. Now, what I'm going to do very briefly is share with you some things why we believe in the churches of God that the Lord's Supper is so important and that it is an ordinance of the church. Did you ever think about that? What makes something an ordinance and not an ordinance? How come a meet and mingle luncheon isn't an ordinance? Or an old-fashioned hymn sing isn't an ordinance? Or even a child dedication isn't an ordinance? Why are these things not ordinances? Well, if you will, there was a book that was written many years ago by a pastor in the churches of God named C.H. Forney. And he found that regarding these ordinances in the church, there were five things that they had in common. And you can see them up there on that chart that's displayed in the left-hand column. The characteristics of an ordinance, we believe, what they have in common, things like the Lord's Supper, feet washing, and baptism is this. Um, they have divine authority, meaning that Jesus said, this is what I want you to do. There's a formal observance that takes place in that it's not something that you do alone, um, all by yourself, or just um, willy-nilly, but it's a formal observance where the people of God are gathered. The ordinances also use material elements, unlike other things that we do in the church. And it also teaches us about the redemptive history, how Jesus saved us, and number five, the spiritual experience we receive or that we experience in our own lives. So having said that, what about the Lord's Supper? Looking at the right-hand column, is there divine authority? Did Jesus say, I want you to do this? Well, clearly he did. Several passages indicate this, one of which would be Luke 22, 11 to 15, where Jesus said, I want you to do this. Do this in remembrance of me. Is it a formal observance? Yep. We're coming together today here and at 1030. Believers are present for this wonderful experience. Are there material elements? You bet there are. We have the bread and the cup. What about the redemptive history, the redemptive story of Jesus? What does this particular uh, ordinance, this time that we will share together, remind us of? It reminds us that Jesus Christ died for us, his death. That's what it's all about. And what about our spiritual experience? It reminds us that just as Jesus died through his death, we also, the old person we were, that dies and we become a new person. That's our salvation. That's what all of this reminds us of. That's why we are here. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because we believe Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We believe it's right and proper from time to time to come together and to participate in his body and his blood by taking these symbols and being reminded and even reliving what Jesus did for us. That's why we're doing it. So if we do it because we are wanting to do this, but also give our total allegiance to something else, that's not right. Or if we're doing it because, well, we just do it once a quarter, so let's go and give it over, get it over with, that's not the attitude either. If we're doing it because someone is forcing us to or making us feel guilty if we don't, that's not valid either. Why are we doing this? It's because this is what Jesus has commanded us to do. And in so doing, it's a blessing as we remember in a tangible way the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. That's why we're doing this. Amen.